no, no, no. no. Despite the Ukraine war, Kenneth Rosen in 2022 writes, at the Arctic Dawes, Russia looks to expand regional operations and bases, escalating competition for newly available resources that could precipitate armed conflict. However, America is asleep at the wheel. As national security analyst David Auswald in 2021 writes, no recent strategies obligate significant spending in the region for new capabilities or permanent presence. Arthur Herman of Harvard University continues in 2022, although the Pentagon did issue an Arctic strategy, these are isolated documents with no plans for coordination or action. Unfortunately, analyst Sharon Burke writes in 2021 that America's neglect has allowed Arctic infrastructure to severely deteriorate, with over 70% endangered by permafrost thaw, erosion, and structural issues. Altogether last month, Jeremy Greenwood of the Brookings Institute outlined the urgent need to construct new roads, communications networks, airfields, as well as renovate deteriorating infrastructure and relocate assets threatened by climate change. A lack of infrastructure ties our hands in the northern frontier, with a 2022 meta-study by Oxford University's Abby Tingstad confirming the lack of infrastructure, transportation, and satellite coverage has left our troops effectively blind with their hands tied across the Arctic region. Overall, the Arctic's crumbling infrastructure leaves forces underprepared and millions without access to hospitals, schools, and clean water. Heightened U.S. military presence would help in two key ways. The first is infrastructure development. Matthew Revels of Georgetown University in 2022 writes, military deployments in the Arctic would be paired with infrastructure investments in order to overcome the Arctic's formidable geography. An increased presence will result in the construction of ports, airfields, communications, roads, and other infrastructure. The second is investment. In a 40-year-long study, UK Hill writes in 2017 that an increased military footprint gives investors stability and security, adding greater confidence to allocate capital and resources to the region. Thus, Hill concludes for every 100 additional US de troops deployed, a region experienced a $21 million increase in total domestic and foreign investment. Empirically, the UN Conference on Trade and Development found that these investments enabled the construction of vital roads, ports, power grids, and other infrastructure critical for military operations and economic growth. Additionally, as a NATO member, the U.S. would catalyze allied investment in the region for collective security. Stefan Kotija in 2019 confirms that since the 1950s, complex investment projects drew joint funding from nearly all of Europe. Empirically, NATO themselves estimate that joint alliance funding has been successfully implemented in more than 13,000 large-scale projects across the alliance. Arctic infrastructure development is critical for two reasons. The first is economic growth. Without improvements in infrastructure, Olivia Hoop concludes in 2022, deteriorating infrastructure will force the displacement of entire communities, inflicting a massive human cost. Fortunately, military investment forms the basis for civil infrastructure. Empirically, WBV analyzed in 2021 that projects like the Panama Canal, GPS, and thousands of medical and transportation networks were formed by military development. Overall, in a 15-year study from 2017, Taha Zagudi concluded that a 1% increase in infrastructure decreases poverty by 4.53% thanks to job creation and access to hospitals, clean water, and schools. The second impact is deterring Russia. In his 2021 meta-study, Professor David Oswald writes that strategic investment to bolster Arctic infrastructure and expand military capabilities would substantially raise the costs for Russian military aggression in the region. Oswald furthers that Putin still recovering from recent strategic failures, increased Western presence, and improved defense would serve as a powerful deterrent since Russia wouldn't be able to withstand another humiliating defeat, forcing Putin to change his risk calculus. Otherwise, Kenneth Rosen of Harvard University concludes Russian military aggression in the Arctic would endanger the security of America and its regional allies, raising the chance of armed conflict and jeopardizing millions of lives. Thus affirmed. Can I see 1% increase in infrastructure, 4.5% decrease? Okay, so just making sure you want to see 1% increase decrease in poverty, right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> One step aside. All right. It's, yeah. Clarification again, University K A on the neg and Zayn Ashraf the first speaker.
So, uh, for those ready, we'll start my first word. The US has commonly only focused on a me mentality while disregarding its own impacts on the environment and community. This mentality would undoubtedly have catastrophic impacts on an environment as fragile as the Arctic. Thus, we negate the resolution. Our first contention is the climate. Bamber 22 finds that the Arctic is very sensitive to climate change, and that is, and that is, is warming nearly four times faster than the rest of the world. With that, there are two ways that the military harms the environment. The first way is infrastructure. The US makes irresponsible decisions when it comes to building and the placement of infrastructure. Unfortunately, SICRA 19 explains that construction currently contributes to 23% of emissions and 50% of climate change. Even worse, the US is inconsiderate when deciding where to build infrastructure. Sharma 18 reports that 90% of all infrastructure is built in areas with the most diverse ecosystem. Even after construction is done, they are extremely negligent to communities and habitats around them. Perkins 22 argues that the DOD is not doing enough to protect the people. At least a dozen military bases have leaked upwards of 9,000 chemicals that have all been linked to serious diseases. Lewis 21 finds that the U.S. annihilated the Navajo Reservation by conducting nuclear warhead tests for 10 years with bombs that had a thousand times the power of what was dropped on Hiroshima. Traces are still there as Lewis furthers that more than 75 years later, residents are still experiencing life-threatening diseases. The second way is emissions. Brown University in 2019 writes that the DOD is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. This is unlikely to change regardless of any statements made by the DOD because Lewis 21 writes that emissions are locked in due to the military's dependence on existing aircraft and warships. The impact is climate change. Emissions are uniquely worse for the Arctic as Mooney 23 finds that the melting of Arctic ice releases methane into the atmosphere. This is tragic. As EDF 23 writes, the methane has 80 times the warming power that CO2 does. Every degree counts, as Arnoff and Denvir 21 concludes that millions of lives can be saved by preventing each additional tenth degree of warming. Our second contention is genocide. Sub 1A, displacement. Philcom 22 explains that with the establishment of permanent bases and facilities, armed forces pose challenges in land use and result in conflicts with rights holders. For example, Baldwin 23 confirms that the military forcibly evicted 1,500 indigenous peoples from an island so that the United States could build a military base there without people living nearby. Rahim 22 states the U.S. colonialist mentality is still evident today. The U.S. military expands its presence and terraforms indigenous land into property for military bases. Entire tribes and cultures lose their homes and are displaced from their own lands. This leads to cultural genocide. Arctic, the Arctic Center furthers the indigenous people have a specific connection to land that they have inhabited. Rights to land and natural resources are important to the survival of, indi of indigenous peoples in the Arctic. Subpoint B is international oppression. As the U.S. increases military buildup, so does Russia. Caller 23 finds that at a time when tensions between the U.S. and Russia are escalating, a, a military buildup in the Arctic could fuel competition and result in increased Russian military. Simonson 23 writes that increased Russian involvement prompts indigenous rights violations. Russian indigenous people's rights are continuously violated as their homelands experience development without their consent. This limits access to tradition and violates indigenous rights to sustainable livelihoods, health, nutritious foods, and education. The impact is colonial rule that will inevitably spiral into genocide. Phillips 13 finds that the greater the intensity of colonial rule, the greater the likelihood that it is genocidal. Which Mardikin and Galania 23 write could kill up to four, uh, the 4, 475,000 indigenous people of the Arctic. Moreover, the positive feedback loop of indigenous genocide and colonialism causes generations of global violence. Stanley 19 confirms that decolonial efforts that emphasize indigenous culture are essential to challenge the extinction of indigenous peoples. Thus, we negate and I stand ready for projects. That's good. Can I get the first question? Actually, I have a couple questions. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. On your, are you, on your second contention about indigenous genocide, which of your examples is the most recent? I know you gave in like nuclear tests and like the occupation of an island. Which which one of those would you point as your most recent evidence? Well, like I say, like bald, like if you're looking for most recent evidence, I can give you like Baldwin twenty three. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but specifically, like it tells you that it evicted one thousand five hundred indigenous people from an island. So the of course, the US military I understand Baldwin is from twenty twenty three, but this event did not happen in twenty twenty three. 
what what like from when does Baldwin isolate that this displacement occurred? We can send you the card afterwards, but if you're trying to make the argument that the United States has somehow like reformed their like their like format of and like their treatment of indigenous peoples, they simply have not. You can just look to not only the history of the United States, but also how they're treating the indigenous peoples in America. Well, but, our, can I go? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. On investment, you say. Actually, let's talk about your first contention. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about like an increase in infrastructure development, right? Yes. And our first contention. Is yeah, specifically. So, like, sp uh, when a military goes into when military goes into a place and we see more conflict there, why does that make investors of course. more secure? The first thing to note is that the status quo that we've isolated is uniquely bad. The Greenwood evidence tells you that 70% of infrastructure is in disarray, and second, that the private sector is not in the pool right now due to the Arctic's high cost environment. That the, when the military goes in, it would reassure Wait. investors. Yeah. That's, that's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm not talking. I'm not like I'm not asking you to re-explain your link. I'm mm -hmm. asking you specifically when, because when we send the military place, we'll see more conflict there. If we see more conflict well, there, why does that make? Well, not necessarily. More We've given you a 40-year study from UK Keo that finds that for every 100 additional troops, there is a 21 million dollar increase investment, which is the yeah, only empiric on this. That's issue. a great empiric, <laughs> but like that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking on the warrant level, not on the empirical level, on the warrant level. Well, Why specifically, when you see more conflict in the place and less ability to well, extract chemicals? you have to win that there would be more conflict in the first place. Okay, Our I don't think it's too hard to learn that more well, military means more conflict. But we well, can well, no, that Russia's, we're, we're arguing that Russia's expanding right now, which is why the military okay. needs to go in and stabilize. Even not too long, you All right, let's talk about this argument regarding emissions. So you say that the DOD is the largest emitter in the world. Are you sure this is the case? Because like it seems to me that the DOD would not be like a rivaling emitter compared to like China, Russia, things like that. Well, great, it's great like it seems to you like that way, but our evidence like indicates the contrary. Specific so, like, that they are the greatest like emitter. So the DOD emits more than China and Russia. Well, I look it's specific institutions. I'm not saying like just like the DOD in general. I'm not saying like America in general. Specifically the DOD. So 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 to get it straight, the DOD emits more than major global powers as one institution. Okay, not, not just like China as an entire institution, but maybe like the, if you like se section off China into individual institutions, like how the in DOD is an individual institution. Okay, America. so institutionally, the DOD emits a lot, but it is not the greatest emitter per se. And why that not? Well, that's what I'm trying to clarify, right? Like, I'm wondering why your evidence, like the way you read it, is that DOD is the largest emitter in the world, which certain, certainly leads me to believe that it would rival the biggest emitters in the world. But now you just told me, you know, it's yeah, only yeah. bigger than an institution. You can answer in the Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that, like, it's the biggest emitter of the world itself. Like, you can compare it to not an entire country in China, but specifically institutions and branches of okay. the government in China. Okay. Okay, we'll start running about now. So it'll just be down my appendix page. Is anyone not ready? Sounds good. At the very top, in action, leaves us sitting like ducks in an emission oven. On the argument of climate change, Plumer 23 writes that under current policies, Earth is on pace to heat up by 2.1 to 2.9 Celsius this century. In fact, Crown Heart 23 furthers that even though progress is happening now, it isn't happening fast enough, and as of now, climate change is inevitable which means that the only chance that we can even have a shot at saving climate you know, and solving climate change is if you vote AF. At that point, let's talk about the argument of infrastructure. First off, infrastructure is actually good for climate change. The Silva 21 writes that Alaska's coasts are abundant in untapped wind resources. Solar energy is increasingly valuable for applications, and U.S. energy infrastructure will allow the U.S. to increase power production in the Arctic and help fight climate change. Secondly, military involvement would inspire scientific cooperation. Garamond 22 writes that defense strategy develops partnerships with allies for the challenges of the future. This solves climate change. As Bond 23 writes, no single nation can solve climate change. We improve understanding and solve through collaboration with allies. Thirdly, new infrastructure development won't be as high in emissions. For example, the MIT is building new tech where they can avoid emissions. For example, they've recently developed a new type of concrete that has net zero emissions. Secondly, the argument that they've made on construction is totally non-unique. We see construction happening all over the world, all of which will increase emissions anyways.
Finally, they can see the resilient evidence at the top of our case, which says that Russia is already building up now. One, this means that infrastructure is being developed anyway, so emissions are going to increase. And two, this also means that the genocide argument is going to happen regardless. On their second link about emissions. First, the military is set to be net zero by 2050. Brand 22 writes that military bases are stepping up efforts to reduce carbon solar panels, and by then the army will induce a microgrid on every base by 2035, which will reach net zero emissions by 2050. Secondly, the military is getting better. McFarland 23 writes that U.S. military oil is down 15 million from 2018, and emissions fell over 4 million. Renewables, fuel efficient vehicles, smaller exercises all contribute to decline in fuel use. Thirdly, deployments are synonymous with sustainability. McCartney 22 writes that enhancing army infrastructure to climate change reduces emissions and adapts to climate change. The army's transition to electrical vehicle will help achieve tactical self-sufficiency and reduce energy needs. At that point, let's talk about their second contention about cultural genocide. First off, indigenous communities are already dying. Shulman 19 writes that our communities see out migration due to a lack of employment, remoteness, lack of education, and health services, which by the way, infrastructure solves for every single problem. But, the military is good for indigenous people. First, is infrastructure development. USDA writes that lack of infrastructure is a barrier to economic development for native communities, and PPF 20 writes that infrastructure is essential to the well-being of indigenous communities. Obviously, building infrastructure is the first step towards raising all the boats. Second, is trafficking. Delvin 22 writes that military specialists will need to understand the implications of changing demographics in Arctic areas for operation where human traffickers and transnational criminal organizations operate with limited oversight. This will solve climate change as UCS 23 furthers. Military and unmanned systems will play a key role to detect trafficking in the Arctic. Third is medical assistance. Delvin furthers that partnerships established between special ops and Arctic health facilities will leverage emergency medical service capabilities in remote areas during emergency operations. Delvin furthers that we will need to cooperate because meaningful partnerships with populations and indigenous communities will be established as a prerequisite for special ops operating above the Arctic Circle, which means if we would build infrastructure, it wouldn't be in areas where it would harm indigenous people because we need good relations with them. On top of that, we also build jobs. Devlin finds that the U.S. military will find opportunities for enhanced partnerships with civilians, establishing relationships and building millions of jobs. On our second argument about suppression, first off, again, Russia is already militarizing. Secondly, America would have enough time to publicly communicate to Russia that the military deployments are defensive, which means that Russia does not get on the offensive and they don't militarize. On top of that, Colony 23 finds that Russia is already militarizing, since Libby finds that the entry of Finland into NATO is already destabilizing for Russia. Finally, a war is far worse. If we get drawn in, not only would the war engulf the entirety of Europe, drawing in our allies, magnifying all the suppression that they talk about, but putting troops in would be hasty, meaning we can't help the indigenous. I'm gonna take some crap. Starting on our case. Everyone good? Then let's see. 
Jason likes to get up and rebuttal and make a ton of responses that are not actually responsive to art. The first thing that he says is that the earth, uh, that the earth is already on pace to heat up. That is exactly why we don't want to increase climate change right now. That is also contradictory with his third response on our case, which says that all allies are already cooperating. If allies are already cooperating in the status quo to make like a bu uh, to make a bunch of climate change progress, obviously it is not getting worse. But two. He says that it's good for climate change because there's untapped wind potential, but every single piece of evidence on their case just says that we're going to build roads and stuff. At that point, you're not buying that we're going to, the military, like the military put in place to like defend stuff is going to build a bunch of windmills. Does not make sense. But then, they say that the, the like add more allies equals more cooperation. We're going to argue that there's already cooperation through NATO. That means that there's no reason to uh, affirm. But four, they say that MIT has a bunch of new technology. It does not matter. MIT can have a quantum generator or something, but that doesn't mean that the military is going to have a quantum bomb. Obviously not. But then they say that there's construction all over the world. Fine, then that takes out every <coughs> single argument on their case. That just means that uh, infrastructure building is non-unique because other countries are already building a ton of infrastructure. But then, on our argument about initials, uh, uh, like emissions group, their both of their first two responses, they say that the military is getting better in the status quo. But that is a reason to uh, to negate because that means that you should not affirm right now while the military is still really, really unhealthy for the environment. Don't affirm right now. That. They say that infrastructure reduces emissions. Again, this is not about like roads and stuff like they say in their case. It's literally about some kind of like electrical vehicles. Does not make sense. On the C2. They say that indigenous people are already dying because of, uh, because of lack of education, but that is only because the United States already has military presence in the Arctic. Obviously, the reason that indigenous peoples are being pushed out is because of the US military, but then group their next four responses. All of them are not responsive to our case because they are all talking about, like, none of their infrastructure evidence says that we are actually going to, like, uh, none of their infrastructure evidence actually says that we're going to be like giving it all to indigenous communities, rather that we're just going to be building roads to benefit the military. But then on Russia, group their all, all three of their responses, they're just cross outs, let's get to it then. At that point, go to their case. At the top, they try to frame Russia as this really aggressive actor. No, Russia is peaceful in the status quo for two reasons. First, they don't have the effort, they don't have the ability to attack because they are so bogged down in Ukraine. Their literally military is losing. Obviously, they're not going to launch an offensive in the Arctic. But second, Ledry C. Evans indicates that Russia's ex, uh, interests in the Arctic are purely economic. Obviously, they're not going to want to start a war when their entire GDP is predicated on the oil they get from the Arctic. But even if Russia is building a bunch of infrastructure in the Arctic, that just means that all of the evidence that they read in their case just means that it's already happening because of Russia. There is zero reason to affirm. But let's go to their pro uh, contentions proper. The first thing they say is that like the uh, like uh, that we need to establish a bunch of permanent uh, permanent presence. But if the United States already has eleven thousand troops in the Arctic, and as they say, every one hundred troops increases infrastructure a ton, that means that their argument should have already happened. But they have not because obviously the military is not going to use its infrastructure to help indigenous peoples. Rather, they are going to use their like uh, their like I don't know infrastructure to like build like roads and stuff for military, not for indigenous peoples. But then. They say that there's going to be a bunch of infrastructure development and investment. No, that's only for the military. Obviously, they're not going to go to in, uh, like indigenous peoples. There's no other, like or like other people in the Arctic. That doesn't make any sort of sense. But then. They say that there's allied investment that's going to happen. That just means that investment happens in either world because Finland, Norway, and all NATO countries are already expanding into the Arctic. On this argument about economic growth, their evidence is miscut and power tagged into oblivion. The first line of it literally just says that in when you increase uh, infrastructure domestically, it decreases economic growth. That is critical because we are not going to be expanding into other countries. We're going to be expanding in the United States and Alaska does not make sense. But finally, you can turn their argument on Russia because it actually makes Russian aggression more likely. If Russia has not aggressed in the Arctic, the only time that you actually see Russia aggressing is when they have like uh, is when they're provoked by the U.S. Look at Ukraine. <laughs> Very easy for the next. All right, ready for pause? Yeah. Okay. So, is America a developing country? Give me a hot Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Is America a developing country? No. Okay. So, your anti-donor evidence is that it says that infrastructure is bad for countries. What does it actually say? No. So it says so that fine, infrastructure is bad for developing countries. If we're building infrastructure whoa, in Alaska whoa, whoa, and the whoa, US, whoa, 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 and you just said that America is a developed country, how does it hurt the economy? Okay, your first, the first line of your evidence literally says, contrary to the effect of growth and domestic investment. Obviously, Wait, domestic if investment If you keep on reading on, it clarifies that it's talking about developing countries. It says, 
Really, uh, look, it says, are seeming to decrease poverty in developing countries. It's talking about developing countries. Sure, wait, 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 wait. So if we prove that the United States is not investing into domestic countries, or in, into like developing countries, doesn't that mean that there's literally no effect? Our argument is not about building infrastructure in developing countries. Exactly. Our argument is about so building infrastructure. Our argument is, yeah. Our argument is that infrastructure is broadly good. The evidence, the one line that we've highlighted specifically says that a 1% increase in well, infrastructure well, reduces poverty by 4%. Specific to developing countries, and if the United States is not a developing nation, no. then how okay. are you increasing the, the economy? The insight that you've talked about is specific to developing countries. The evidence is broadly about Jeez, infrastructure what? increasing economy. You literally economy. just pointed out to me that the, set, the line before the part that you highlighted talks I mean, about how investment, again, investment is in We don't have to get bogged down by this evidence comparison debate. The fact of the matter is, is that because we generate down, jobs, we give people health, bad. education, we've always seen an increase in economic I mean, growth in developed countries. I mean, it's not my fault that your evidence is power tagged into oblivion, but I'm going to take a look. We point. read the sentence. It's like just one solid sentence that's highlighted. It's not power tagged. Sure. Let's talk about your argument on like allied investment. Sure. So, is that specific to the United States, or is it any ally who gets invested, like like increases presence, like increases okay, yeah. investment? So the Oswald evidence that we read at the top of the case is really good on this question. It says that right now neither us nor our allies have a coordinated plan for both building infrastructure or military investment, which is why. Like, broadly, NATO has not developed enough infrastructure, and technically, and more importantly, the Rosen evidence says that Russia is still let's, aggressive let's in the region. About that really quick. But, like, so I think all of these NATO countries are already expanding in the Arctic, and they still do not have a cohesive plan, why is the United States going to be any different? Okay, again, the Oswald evidence also answers this question. It talks about how a coordinated affirmative action, substantially increasing military presence, would require a coordinated action. Obviously, we can't just throw 100,000 troops so wait, randomly wait, across the Arctic. We would need a coordinated plan. We already do a bunch of coordinated action when, I don't know, Norway and Finland expand into the Arctic. They didn't. Can you name oh, me? Can you name me? Can the you, idea that can Norway you name and Finland me? are not in the Arctic is Wait, ridiculous. First off, if Norway and Finland are already expanding, that means emissions are increasing and genocide is already happening. But can you name no, me one project? Our is can you name me one project that Norway? Cases. Can you name me one project that Norway or Finland have developed? Yeah, they have developed a ton of oil drilling infrastructure in the Arctic. Okay. At that but point, I'm confused. Your second link is about suppression and how broadly military development is it's bad for indigenous people. the United States because we give specific imperatives. How um, your second link is not specific to the United States, yes, but yes. that's, um, I don't know about that one, but that's cross. All right, we'll take clap. Yes, sir. <laughs> Two forty left. To order this speech, we'll start on our case. It'll do broad comparison, and then it'll go to your case. Is everybody good? We believe that the most important argument in today's round is our argument about infrastructure. 70% of our infrastructure is in tatters because of erosion and structural issues caused by climate change. But you know that whenever the military goes into the region, it is paired with infrastructure investment because troops needs roads. It's common sense that we paint a picture of stability that for every 100 troops deployed, there's a $21 million increase investment, which would allow us to renovate roads, start new infrastructure projects, and green the region of climate change. That said, the first impact is about economy, that through this economic gain, a 1% increase in infrastructure decreases poverty by 4.53%, helping millions through gaining access to key economic expansion. The second argument about deterrence is that Russia is aggressive right now. Actions speak louder than words. And while it is easy to say that Russia is defensive at heart, if you look at actions like Russia's cutting of Nord Stream, its cutting of cables, and its buzzing of American airspace off the coast of Alaska, these Russian... These Russian activities, although may be defensive at heart, certainly have offensive implications, which is a reason why we need to increase our troops to deter future provocations, which all have a risk of causing a conflict, which would kill millions of lives, but the only way we stop it is by power projection. Let's address their responses. They've made an argument that says that Russia is peaceful, but I've listed to you several examples of Russia's aggression and that the Rosen evidence is post-Ukraine and isolates that because of Ukraine, Russia has more incentive to expand economically, which is why we've still seen the signs after their evidence. They say that in Russian infrastructure should have triggered our argument. No, this flows to us. If Russia is expanding in the Arctic right now, it is harming natives, it is increasing emissions, and the best way to stop that is by affirming and deterring Russian expansion, which is a reason not only why their case should have happened already, but a reason why you should look to the affirmative as the best solvency to the negatives issues. They've made an argument that there are 11,000 troops and a lot of arguments on how like the, the military is sufficient already. You can group all of them. The Greenwood evidence is very good. It says that 
50% of roads are still in tatters. And also the framing done on their case is that indigenous communities still face several harms, which is why we need more and that Russia is aggressive. So we need more and is also the reason why Nordic expansion is not sufficient to trigger our argument. They make an argument that infrastructure decreases economic growth. You can read the card, it's very specific. Also increasing access helps millions of communities and they don't have a counter piece of evidence. I don't know why we're muddling the debate here. All right, that being said, Russia would not be aggressive while pro being provocated either. They've conceded that we could signal to Russia that troops are defensive. Name me a reason why us building roads in Alaska would send a signal to Russia that, that uh, like we're being aggressive. On their case, though, the first thing on the emissions argument is that they've conceded broad climate change is occurring, that the Earth will warm by 2.1 to 2.9 degrees Celsius, and that the only way to solve is by green infrastructure like Alaska. They just say no planning. A, the U.S. has plans and will put a microgrid on every house by 2050 for better self-sufficiency but B, Alaska is a huge pool for resources. On genocide, if we prevent a war, you vote here because that means more military expansion in native territory. They've also conceded that we have to con consult native allies because they have the best understanding of the region and we develop partnerships to establish American security best. Vote for history, vote for imperialists. You should affirm in today's round. When you Climate change. The U.S. military harms the Arctic environment in two ways versus infrastructure, which is harmful during and after construction. Sakara 19 explains that construction emissions contribute to 50% of climate change, but after that, Perkins 22 writes that the U.S. military has leaked upwards of 9,000 chemicals linked to serious diseases. The impact is climate, uh, the climate change, which injures or kills hundreds of millions of lives that can be saved by preventing a tenth of degree of warming. Let's go on to their responses. They really only say that climate change is unstoppable. They're kind of trying to make this try or die analysis, but really in their world, it's die or die. Specifically, their own piece of evidence tells you that we're already collabing or we're collaborating with these other countries, meaning that we're already solving for it. The only risk of off, uh, the only risk of like making it worse is by introducing the US United, United States military into the Arctic and making it far worse. Now, let's go on to genocide. They make a few responses here, specifically just talking, like, with them, they're just about, about collaborating with native allies. They specifically tell you that we're building a native territory, and our evidence tells you that's not what the natives want. That's word for word what I get in summary, that we're building in native territory. That's not what the natives want. Why would you disregard their wants? He also says at the end of his speech, vote for history. Yeah, vote for history. Vote for the thousands of, like, vote for the, like, thousands of years that the United States has been oppressing indigenous peoples. That's great. You can go on to the weighing. First, what we're going to prereq, because if we're focusing on climate change, then there's not going to be any economic development because they're making climate change so much worse. But second, we're going to, uh, um, we're going to say that uh, we're going to prereq again, specifically that infrastructure gets messed up by uh, climate change problems, meaning it's not sustainable in the first place. Now that you know we're winning our side, and we're winning, and even if you buy the case we're winning, let's go on to their side. Specifically, let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about Russia. Uh, they tell you that they conceived the analysis specifically that Russia is purely in uh, the Arctic for like the economic incentive. They just say that, oh, well, uh, like, Rosen is postdated by Ukraine. That doesn't, ma that doesn't matter. Specifically, Russia is still going to care about the economic incentive. And if you have a war in a place, you're ruining the economic incentive there. You're ruining all the resources. You're not getting anything. Remember, there is zero reason why Russian, and then next, there, remember there's zero reason why Russian infrastructure is any different from the United States infrastructure in the first place. Although they never read you why, so if Russia's already building infrastructure there, then how is it different? How are we not seeing their impacts trigger? Next, um, we'll extend the point about how we're, oh yeah, we're already collaborating with allies in the Arctic, with the economies, it, like an ally investment is gonna happen either way. They clean can see that. Uh, yeah, other allies, per like our, our own, per their own evidence, uh, like a Penalt, and also uh, like like the per like NATO countries, like Norway and Finland, are already increasing development in the Arctic. But on like even if you buy uh, this whole point, you're going to extend the turn specifically that we uh, that as you increase U.S. presence, you're only risking increasing Russian presence because Russia has never aggressed in the status quo. The uh, the only risk of offense you have is for the uh, for our side, specifically the negative, because Russia has not aggressed, and you outweigh the probability. Because we saw it happen in Ukraine. For all these reasons, unity. I'll get the grant. Yeah. You want to take the first question? Sure. 
So let's talk about this argument regarding, yeah, let's talk about this argument that is, it's die or die if you vote for the affirmative. Yeah. So you're the negative. You do not advocate for any status quo change. So our argument, so the first, the third response that you leave in rebuttal is that we are collaborating with no, allies. No, it's not. Okay, sure, well, it's that's how it, it, it sure, creates collaboration. That's what I frontline it as in my it's second also, rebuttal. Okay, I say that allies are summer. all. Okay, you, you can look at my rebuttal. So, so that was I, not the response yeah, I made. So I can, can the response, so if yeah. I can continue. Yeah, go ahead. So the way I implicate it in the second rebuttal is that allies, because they're allies, are already collaborating on a bunch of climate change solutions. That is okay. never responded to okay. itself. Like you can look, at your, you can look that at your rebuttal doc, that's great. It wasn't oh, I can tell you what does respond so. to it. The Oswald evidence, which was conceded yeah. at the top so. of case, which says that the US and our allies do not have a coherent strategy okay. in the but that is not responsive. That is not um, responsive. Just talking, okay, so if I could just finish really quick. Sure. So just having a bunch of collaboration in the Arctic does not matter in relation to global climate change. We can collaborate in, in climate change, I don't know, in South America, does not like climate change is like not like this one thing that stays in like a stationary place. So collaboration doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm no. The point is that in the status quo, we are collaborating and solving for climate change, which is all right. Possible. But think about it like this: if the Bloomer evidence finds that climate change will rise by two point one to two point nine degrees, anyways, doesn't that mean your scenario for like that factors yeah. in collaboration? Yeah. Because, like, because well, we're well, already well, working well, towards well, a better well, future. You're working well, to stop that better. Well, future. yes, but that is the most recent estimate of climate change. So if this argument okay, is yeah, going and from that most recent estimate, we are going to start from now build on wait, a better future. But our evidence is very, like it's like it's like this yeah. year. Like we cut it like so it's very recent. It factors in collaboration and finds that climate change is still so getting worse. Daniel, that's all well and good, but it doesn't actually matter because that is not an analysis made in summary wait, where wait, I'm a conceded, sure I'm a conceded it, analysis from our okay. that first we're off, already solving in the First process. off, it definitely was in summary, but if we want to talk about what's actually good, it's the crown of our evidence, which says even though we are taking action, again, it's not happening fast enough, which is why emissions <coughs> are still on the upbeat. Yes, okay, sure. that's fine. We get, we're going to take okay. a question now. Yeah, sure. Um, let's talk about your arguments on infrastructure. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. You're saying that no one is building infrastructure in the Arctic um, right now, right? The, the, the way we frame it is from Greenwood, which is clean conceded. That says 70% of infrastructure in the Arctic is deteriorating right now. Additionally, that indigenous people oh, are right. suffering. Wait, wait, wait. So if other countries are fixing the infrastructure and they're it's still well, deteriorating. They're not. That's so well, again, it's so like, so it's okay. there. there's What's no other countries that are militarizing the Arctic. I understand. Like, like one, these countries can't like babysit us in Alaska. That's an area we have to do our own investment. But secondly, you know, we frame so, the argument as Greenwood. Like, again, it's like a recency so, debate again. Like, so your impacts are limited to Alaska. Well, there are limits. Like, we really don't want to get bogged down in this yeah. evidence comparison. Yeah, we do, because it's, it's like Alaska it's versus the entirety no of the world. No matter how you slice it, the deal. fact of the matter is that infrastructure development is one good for power production and two good for the economy. Yeah. These are all not unresponded not arguments. Not, not if you're like one good for in Alaska versus the entire Yeah, we can settle the final. That's fine. Okay. We'll take five points right now. Good for two arguments in final focus, both of which you cannot vote for. On their first contention about climate change, they have 100% dropped the Plumer evidence, which is the most recent evidence on this question. It takes into account everything my opponent says and says that because we are not doing enough, emissions are still on the rise. What does this mean? Emissions are on the rise, anyways, which means that in both worlds, their arguments will happen regardless. They say it's die or die, but the fact is that it's try or die, because when you affirm even a 1% chance, if you believe there's even a slight chance that building green infrastructure will solve climate change or decrease emissions in any way, sign your ballot for the affirmative right there, because the microgrids argument was 100% conceded coming out of summary. Remember, by 2035, the US military will put a microgrid in every single military base. Not only does this, one, supply green energy for the locals in the area, but two, enables the uh, military to go net zero by 2050. 
On our second argument about um, like genocide. First off, remember, Russia does not aggress because we say to them that we are defensive. This means that Russia never built up their military in the first place so the, the genocide never happens. They've also conceded that we will consult with natives because they know the land better and obviously we would not want to destroy relations with them if we need them for military deployments in the first place. If you don't want to look at where my opponents are losing, you can look at where we're winning. The argument of infrastructure is the cleanest place for you to vote. Remember, right now, 70% of our infrastructure is in tatters. It's easy to say that our allies are filling in, but the truth is that our allies are not doing enough, which is why a substantial increased military presence is crucial, because not only does it, one, require us building new infrastructure, but also it sends a signal of stability, which is why every 100 additional troops increases investment by $21 million. Not only does it solve climate change because we build infrastructure, but it helps improve the lives of indigenous people. The DSA evidence from rebuttals says that this is the biggest barrier preventing indigenous people from getting access to hospitals, education, etc. Finally, they see that Russia is building infrastructure and that our allies are pulling in. Again, our argument is predicated on American military infrastructure. And on that, the more infrastructure we build, the better it is for indigenous people and climate change. Finally, again, um, if there's a war that happens, then it also makes all their arguments worse because there's more militarization, and it also prevents us from focusing on climate change. Incredibly easy, affirmative ballot. We're gonna take the rest of our 20 done in Zaid's summary specifically. Zaid explains that if there is a ton more climate change and the root cause per their own uniqueness evidence of all of this infrastructure decaying is climate change in the first place, the only way that you can actually solve for all of this infrastructure decaying is in the negative world by not increasing climate change. At that point, our argument on climate change is very, very simple. We explain that climate change is being solved in the status quo. They say that the status quo is not enough. Number one, this is new and final. Number two, we're arguing that cooperation is increasing in the status quo, which per Jason's rebuttal is solving climate change now. But then, uh, that's critical because when you do a bunch of infrastructure, it's really harmful during and after construction. And Secret 19 explains when construction emissions contribute to 50% of climate change. And after Perkins 22 writes that US military has leaked upwards of 9,000 chemicals linked to serious diseases and in emissions, like the DOD is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. Then, Jason likes to say that we conceded this argument about how the military is going green. Number one, this was not in summary. Number two, it does not matter because our argument is not just about uh, is not just about like the bases. It is about all of the roads and infrastructures which they like to tout as really really good. On our argument about genocide and indigenous peoples, it's over when they concede uh, Zay's analysis from summary, which indicates that you should look to history per uh, Daniel's own analysis, which says that in history the United States has historically oppressed indigenous people for thousands of years. At that point, yeah. go to their case. This round is over when Jason like makes like concedes a ton of defense. Remember, Russia is already expanding in the Arctic per their own evidence, but they draw no distinction between American infrastructure and Russian infrastructure. If Russia is already making a ton of infrastructure, that means that their argument should already be solved in the status quo. But second, they have conceded that there are a ton of NATO countries that are also increasing in the Arctic. Remember, they draw zero distinction. Jason likes to get up in uh, like final focus and say, oh yeah, it's specific to American military infrastructure, but there is zero warranty given as to why this is true. At that point, it is very, very easy to see that other countries have already expanded in the Arctic, their argument should have already happened, and they will never happen. For those reasons, it's very easy for the negative. Great round, great round. Yeah. 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 